He worked alongside Steve Jobs to revolutionize the way we listen to music and became known as the godfather of the iPod. He spent nearly a decade at Apple, then hatched a company of his own. In 2010, he co-founded Nest Labs, where he's promised to reinvent every unloved product in the home. A promise so thrilling, Google, soon to become Alphabet, snapped up Nest and its star CEO for $3.2 billion. Joining me today on Studio 1.0, Nest CEO and co-founder Tony Fidel. Tony, so great to have you here. It's great to be here, Thank Emily. you so I much for it. coming. You were born in Michigan, but you moved around a lot. 12 schools in 15 years? Yeah. Well, you know, being at, going to so many different cities, there's a lot of, of positive impact, right? I was able to, to learn about various different types of people, like in being in New York and then being in Texas, being in the Midwest. They're very, you know, human nature is the same, but the way they display it might be different. How do you think that affects your work and how you lead? I think a lot of times that, um, you know, by always being the new kid, you always have to, you're always distanced from what's going on around you. So you're always an analyzing, you're evaluating, you're seeing what people are doing, what they're not doing, because you're not in it. You're more an observer. I think that really helps because that allows me to always step back analyze a situation and then not just in, inside the company like in a, uh, from a human perspective but also from a product perspective. What are people using? How are they using them out in the real world and looking at those details? So your grandfather had a really big influence on you who was a carpenter, right? Yes, he was. And you guys used He's to an build, educator. You guys used to build stuff together. Yeah, absolutely. He would ha hold classes like wood shop and metal shop. When he retired, he still did that with us, my brother and I, building soapbox derby racers and fixing lawnmowers and bikes together. So we learned from a very young age, like three or four years old, how things worked, how to, you know, how to use tools. I didn't even know what a computer was, right, until I actually saw my first one in, you know, in about 79 or so. So you went on to the University of Michigan, you studied computer engineering, and then in 1991 you moved to Silicon Valley. Yes, I worked with another guy to build a startup in high school. Oh, really? Right? We were doing mail order for Apple II and building and designing software and writing it for Apple II. Ultimately, I was so frustrated because we didn't have the internet then, right? And I thought, I need to get to Silicon Valley as fast as possible because I would be reading Mac Week magazine religiously every week on the back. <laughs> what are the rumors? What's going right. on? Right, so even back then you were obsessed with Apple. Oh, I was absolutely obsessed with all things computing in the, in the 80s and, uh, you know, it first started with Apple II. You worked on the earliest mobile devices, like the precursor to this at General Magic at Philips you started your own company fuse and by the end of the decade you probably knew more about mobile devices than literally anybody on the planet I just kept doing the thing that I really love to do tell me about the first time you met Steve Jobs Andy Hertzfeld who was uh, one of the founders of General Magic he had a birthday party Steve happened to be there and we talked for maybe a couple of minutes but that was the very first time I ever met him but then the next time I met him was uh, literally to give the pitch for the iPod, uh, what would become the iPod. You gave the pitch for the original iPod. Yeah, well, there was a whole team of us, and but I was leading the I was leading the charge of talking about what it was. It was literally a layout of what uh, digital music could be, what the challenges were. There were three different concepts, and the 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 one that we always say for the end was the one we thought was best. It was the most expensive, it was the riskiest one, and Steve was very engaged and very much driving we, you know we had a presentation you know a deck but he ne he flips through the deck and then he just jumps around there was no like linear format you just kind of you know just braced yourself for impact and he would throw questions out and throw out conjectures and you just sat there and you rolled with it you know roll with the tide so. so where did it end well it ended at literally we're going to do this and tony we want you to lead it i had been in other you know executive presentations where it's like oh it's going to take four months to decide or whatever it was no it was from the beginning of the meeting he was fully engaged to the end of it was like okay committal and we're gonna do it we're gonna take on sony i said we have to deal with sony it's like we're gonna get sony i'm like but sony's number one in every audio category in the world for, per, for personal audio how are we gonna beat it and he's like no we're gonna do that you've become known as the godfather of the ipod which in a way makes you the father of the entire product line, the iPod, the iPhone, the That's iPad, nice, but... <laughs> maybe the watch. <laughs> but really, I mean, the iPod itself had such a dramatic impact on everything that Apple's done since. 
Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a big turning point from going from computers to consumer electronics for the company. So what was your relationship with Steve like? Well, it was very the... professional. Um, you, you wouldn't, you know, there were times when it was friendly. I wouldn't say we were friends per se, you know, in terms of like hanging out. But it was very friendly, and, but it was tough at times. But it was a great mentor kind of relationship at times. And there were other times when he'd call me on my crap or I'd call him on the crap sometimes. He didn't like that. But whether we were fighting or, you know, being friendly, it was all about the best thing for the customer and the experience, which was what I loved, you know, love to have. And uh, that, I, I would never trade that for, for anything. I read it was kind of like father and son. Is that... Yeah, there was love-hate moments, you know? There were times when we were like, okay, we're going to take on the world. And then there were other times like, oh, I got to... Strangle them. If there isn't tension, then there's not creation. You need to have creative tension to, right. to really change things. You quit a couple times. You fired yeah, I did. you a couple times. You made up. Yeah, yeah. It, like, was, a, it, was, a, it was a dramatic relationship. Um, <laughs> there's this modern mythology of Johnny Ive as the Apple design guy. And I wonder how do you remember it? Was it more of a team effort than sometimes this well, mythology would lead? People to believe look you know when it comes to when it comes to design there is no right or wrong there is opinion and s different people had different opinions and led the charge uh, for certain decisions and so there was a team effort between you know myself Johnny uh, the marketing team Steve and we would talk about the features feature sets what it could look like grappling with those things and there were certain decisions I could make myself about how we were going to implement it but then there were certain things of what it might look like and Johnny had a big opinion on that but Steve regardless of whether it was me or Johnny or Mark product marketing Steve always rendered the final opinion yeah. right on almost anything that involved the customer so it was very much a team team oriented thing so is this sort of mythology that pits you and Johnny against each other is there any truth to that uh, like I said creative tension is is what makes things better. So we had a lot of, we had times when we saw eye to eye and there was times when we didn't. And, uh, but that's what makes a better product. So was there tension? Sure, there's tension at times. Was it personal? No, it was all about the business and the product. And I think that's what made the magic happen. How did your relationship with Steve compare to your relationship today with Larry Page? I would say that they are two very, very uh, talented people, very, very smart people. They come from two very different backgrounds. Larry is very smart technology. He loves technology, he loves to see beyond the horizon, and, and he's an aficionado of product and how it can turn into a product. Steve was very much a marketing person who had a love of product, and so he would always look at it through that eye. And so I'm in the middle, I'm a product guy. There was a Fortune headline that read, is Tony Fidel the next Steve Jobs or the next Larry Page? <laughs> I'm Tony Fidel. It's that simple. I'm just Tony Fidel. So what's similar and different about how you run Nest and how Steve Jobs ran Apple? Similar is accountability. Um, oh, really understanding, trying to understand your customer as best as possible. Difference is, is I think it's giving a lot of more credit to the team and really trying to be more inclusive with getting ideas from people and, and trying to, 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 to mold those things in and listening to them and and not trying to get involved in every little detail. You also ended up poaching quite a few Apple employees. Yeah, I did get a call from Steve about that. In 2008, you left Apple. In 2010, Nest was born. Tell me how the plan for Nest was hatched. <laughs> Because of my, my time with my grandfather, I learned a lot about houses, and I was always fixing them even before Nest. When it came to designing uh, a home for a family, uh, I didn't just let an architect run with it. I wanted to get into every little detail, and that's when I found the, you know, all of the problems in the home, and specifically heating and cooling. And even though when I told my wife, I was like, I want to make a thermostat, she looked at me like, you're nuts. And I was like, no, let me tell you. And when you explain the situation, and it's not just a thermostat, they go, and their eyes perk up and go, I think you should do it. So you've reinvented the thermostat, the smoke detector. You gave uh, cameras, home security cameras, a, a complete makeover. You know, before you even got to the cameras, though, like less than five years passed, and Google snaps you up. You sell to Google for $3.2 billion. Right. I think the first decision was, should we allow Google to invest in the company? And that was two and a half years earlier than 
um, the actual you know acquisition and through building a relationship and really getting to know Larry and Sergey and um, various people inside the team we got more and more comfortable with the executives and, and a lot of the people we were working with through that the investment process as well as the two preceding two and a half years so we had been dating for a while in a way right so we were dating before we got married for about two and a half years so yeah. we really got to know each other and then the final part was you know the last three months was really this maybe we should get engaged discussion should we get engaged well do you want to have kids do you you know where do you want to live and what would we call the kids and what would our last names be so it was kind of all of those little details before we said we were going to get married was there any part of you that said god i don't know this is my company my baby maybe we could be bigger randy Comisar, kleiner perkins thought sure. you could be far bigger than even 3.2 billion dollars it was never about money it was about building the right thing and so this wasn't about money yeah the ni the number was nice and yeah. don't get me wrong but this was about a 10 a 15 year vision and i knew that we were going to need big arms around us to help us get there because I remember how long it took to go from iPod to iPhone and those things and you need a lot of resources to do that just to be standalone people would go oh you need to go public oh you need to raise more money yeah. I just I didn't want to go public so when you saw that number when you when you when you had the gut feeling you just had to go with it it's like when you get married you never know what it's gonna be like on the other side you trust your gut you've done all the analysis but at the end of the day it's all about emotional decision it's not a rational one it's funny because people still wonder why didn't you sell to Apple you worked at Apple it feels like Apple was that ever really an option we considered all the possible in, in, um, acquisition targets and um, and and through through that you know they were obviously on the list but at the end of the day you know been there done that Google has massive massive compute power in the cloud and all kinds of algorithms and research around where we're headed and there was a huge part of server technologies and software that we would need yeah. to be able to to pull it off you continue to run nest as a yep. semi-independent company yep. how has your role changed how have the goals of nest changed since this transition more faster right that's it and we laid out a roadmap a two to three year roadmap and we saw eye to eye on all the stuff and Larry's like just go implement it as fast as you possibly can right so it was like no I'm not gonna go changing it I don't want, like go this is we believe in this go so how do you think about the next new product how do you decide what the next new product is ultimately going to sure. be? sure well I think that first we you know we each every day run into frustrations things around the home where however you're like why is it that way the next thing piece of it is hey why don't you guys make your roadmap I'll make my roadmap so we have like five or ten different groups all making roadmaps of what they think it should look like over the next two years and then we compare notes so would you say you're working on ten different ideas at any given time you know there's new products and there's new services and there's new marketing things if you ask me do I have 10 or 20 I probably have 50 to 70 things always in some state of gestation how much do you see nest as a consumer technology company versus an enterprise solution do you see consumers purchasing devices directly or do you see potentially infrastructure as a better way to get into home so you know this is something that I really learned from Steve jobs you cannot be a b2c company and a b2b company at the same time a b2c company you have to have gut you have to know what you you have to believe what the customers want to buy on a b2b marketplace you just sit there and you ask your customers your top five customers what do you want and you just build what they want and then you sell it we are a b2c company and we will remain a b2c company you also ended up poaching quite a few apple employees yes yes we did. i did get a call from steve about that oh really he called me and said what is all this you're high, you're recruiting from my team I said Steve I'm not recruiting anyone they're coming to us and so you know I said maybe you got to make sure you try to attain retain your employees better <laughs> and that was it and then we had niceties on the phone but okay. you know there were times when like I said the love-hate relationship what would Steve say about Apple if he was here today I think he'd be incredibly pleased you know he said the iPhone would be his legacy product that would live beyond him right um, and the iPhone is iPhone is that right that legacy product is going to take Apple for an, at least another decade or two decades right you're not wearing your Apple watch but what do you think so far I think they did a brilliant job with the hardware um, in terms of like the changeable bands I you know I ran out and bought all kinds of different bands from a software perspective I think it's early days great products become great 
after iter iteration, it's just getting started. Is it something you could see yourself wearing every day? I could wear something like that every day. I just won't charge it every day. Mm. Okay, so they need to work on battery life. I think everybody needs to work on battery life. You volunteered to take on fixing this Google Glass. Yes, I did. So you volunteered to take on fixing this yeah. Google Glass. Yes, I did. Why? Why not? No, seriously. Look at things we wear on the heads today. We wear glasses, you wear earrings, other people wear earrings. We, um, we put on headphones. To think that all of a sudden, nothing on our heads has all of a sudden become imbued with some kind of connectivity and computing, I think that's short-sighted. Mm -hmm. Um, we're seeing it on the wrist now. We're seeing it on feet and chest and everything else. To, to uh, neglect the head doesn't make sense. And to just say, we're done and toss away all that stuff. I was like, we can't toss it away. Let's take what we've learned and let's l learn from it. A little bit like, hey, if you need somebody to fix it, I'd be happy to fix it because I think I understand a little bit of this space. And they said, would you, would you would do that? I said, yeah. So it was kind of like, it wasn't like I just all of a sudden threw myself on the, <laughs> the, f uh, the fire and said, I'm going to do this regardless. No, it was, you know, it was a... A slow, you know, mating process right. before getting married again. Dating again. So, I mean, there are some reports out there. <laughs> more rumors. Mo more foldable, water resistant, more of a rugged design. Yeah. Any, any, any truth to that? All I can say is don't believe everything you read. Are you working on an enterprise version, a consumer version? They're not just going to be for corporations or industries or or you know medical or what have you it's also going to be for consumers and it's going to be more elegant so you I won't feel odd together. wearing this I don't I didn't say that is what you're going to be wearing I don't know how you feel about wearing it right now uh, but I I'm not going to ship anything I won't wear okay all right okay. now you're also a car guy you were one of the first owners of BMW's new electric i8 I, you know I assume you also have a Tesla oh yeah what's missing from the cars you have I think you're going to see some dramatic changes the way we think uh, about these cars and the accessibility in terms of the price points and stuff. But we're still seven to ten years away from a mass switch over. What can Apple do for the car market? If you think about a car, what's a car? A car has batteries, it has a computer, it has a motor, and it has mechanical structure. If you look at an iPhone, it has all the same things. It even has a motor in it. So if you try to say and scale it up and go, oh my God, I can make a car with those same components, there's some truth to that. But the hard stuff is really on the connectivity and how cars could be self-driving and those kinds of things. Really hard and it's all software and services. I think that when you look at either Google's self-driving car program or the alleged Apple thing, it's all looking at it through that lens of software first. Did you ever talk to Steve about building a car? Yes. What did he we say? Did. What did you talk about? Oh, we had a couple of walks, and this was in 2008, about if we were to build a car, what would we build? And we were just, you know, just crazy, like, looking at, oh, what would a dashboard be? And what would this be? What would seats be? How would you f fuel it or power it? But at the end, it was always like, we're so busy. We're so constrained. We can't, you know, it would be great to do it, but we can't. So when Steve was alive, was this something that he was like, we're not doing this. We're not doing this right now. Well, there was a lot of things we said no to. You know, people said, well, at the end of the day, why didn't, we, why didn't the iPod turn into a really great video camera? TVs was another one. But at the end of the day, what was the biggest one that had the biggest uh, dramatic impact on the world was the cell phones. And so we said, okay, we're going to focus all our energy on that. Forget all this other stuff. Those are interesting. We'll let some other company do it. Let's focus on really big market that could have incredible impact well beyond Steve's reign as, as CEO. Google's taking it on too with self-driving cars. Right? Yes, it's great. They blow my mind every time I go over there and talk to Chris or Sergey and see what's going on. And it feels like I'm being driven around by a professional driver. Regardless of whether it's a taxi or Uber or Lyft or any of these things, I, you know, I love those services. But most people who drive do not know how to drive. They just don't. Even if they do it every day for a living, they don't know how to drive. They're not professionals at it. How do they make these cars safe, drive well, but also well-designed and desirable? Sure. To me, self-driving cars have already caught up with consumers because that's what Uber is. It's a self-driving car. It just happens to be a person is driving it. So as far as I'm concerned, they've already made that choice. Now, how do you just make it even better and an even more pleasurable experience? So what's next for you? I mean, do you see staying at Google yeah. forever? 
Yeah, you know, I, get, I got married. I, not, I, didn't, I didn't get married for money and said I was going to get divorced and take half. No, that's not what I did. Very simply, I got married and I, and I volunteered, in a way, for Google Glass. I'm not going anywhere. I love what I do. You've said you regret not being able to, to tell Steve about Nest. Yeah. Or show Steve. I, Nest. Yeah. What would you say to Steve if he were here today? I would just say thank you. I would say thank you. Thank you for putting up with me. I believe he needed me to a little bit. And I definitely needed him to help with the mentoring. And we needed all the team and all the people who came and joined when it was a real dark days at Apple, when there wasn't a lot of money and there was tons of debt and nobody buying our things and our products. So, you know, when you come through that kind of experience together, regardless of what happened, you have to just step back and go, okay. Tony Fidel, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Emily. Great to have you. It was great.